Hi, my name's Sam. I am an interpreter here at Castle Rock State Park and for California State Parks. Welcome to this live stream today. Uh, hope you are at home, hope you're safe. Um, today and for um, the foreseeable future, this park does have a hard closure. Castle Rock State Park is closed. So that means the trails, the campsites, and the parking lots are all closed. But many of the parks in Santa Cruz uh, County have a soft closure, meaning if you live close to a park uh, or you can bike there, you can also walk there, you can hike inside the park. But those also have their parking lots closed. If you want more information about different updates for when the parks are open or just updates in general about the parks, you can visit parks.ca.gov slash flatten the curve in order to find our updates there. All right, I also want to give a land acknowledgement to uh, the ancestral land um, of Castle Rock State Park, and that is for the ancestral land of the Ohlone Tribal Group, uh, more specifically the Achistaka Tribe. So let's get into our program today. Today we are talking about something very important that doesn't just apply to um, nature but it applies to things in our life and that is balance and order all right so one thing that you can think of when you're thinking about balance is when you were a kid or an adult uh, when you learned how to ride a bike or when you learned a new skill but let's take learning how to ride a bike that is something that needs balance in order to be successful it takes a lot of, of attempts to do it but one minor mistake can cause you to fall down, to crash into something. I know as a, as a kid, I crashed my bike a lot and uh, had many uh, scarred knees and uh, lots of band-aids on my knees because of that. So balance is very important for riding a bike. Balance is also very important for uh, nature and ecosystems. So many ecosystems have delicate are delicate and need a uh, a very fine-tuned balance in order for them to be healthy otherwise there can be many consequences even one small change there can be many consequences in the future some ecosystems are far more delicate than others some are pretty resilient but some ecosystems like uh, coral reefs for example or wetlands or even deserts also redwood uh, ecosystems are very delicate and require even more fine-tuned balance than other ones. So I want to read you a few definitions of balance just to get our mind thinking about uh, what this means. So one of these definitions is an even distribution of weight enabling someone or something to remain upright. So another definition is a condition in which different elements are equal or in correct proportions. And here's a definition for the word equilibrium, which is similar to balance. A state in which opposing forces or influences are balanced. Okay? So another term you might often hear that's related to balance in nature is homeostasis. And homeostasis, uh, that term applies to things being relatively stable in uh, an environment that has interdependent elements. So things that depend on each other and one thing can change or impact something else. So today we're going to talk about one of the factors that helps keep stability in an ecosystem. And that factor is the relationship between predators and prey. So we're going to learn about different predators and prey in this park, in Castle Rock State Park and how these relationships are vital to uh, having a healthy and diverse ecosystem. So what is a predator and prey relationship? Well, just like in society, how everybody has a different role to play. Some, some of us are teachers, some of us are coaches, some of us are athletes. We have many different jobs, many different roles. In nature, in ecosystems, animals have different roles not just animals but plants as well so uh, in a biological community not all organisms are competing for the same resource they're competing for different resources right they're not all trying to get the same food they have different roles and they want different resources 
So some animals, which are known as prey, are food for other animals, which are known as predators. And a change in population for one of these uh, species is impacts uh, another population's uh, the amount of, of species in another population. So why are these relationships necessary? Uh, why is stability in an ecosystem necessary? Because it keeps things, uh, it keeps things, well, how can we say it? It keeps an ecosystem healthy. It keeps it diverse. It makes it so that there are many different animals and organisms, and uh, it, it makes for a, whole, a more healthy and diverse ecosystem. So I'll, I want to show you some examples of some interdependence in an ecosystem. For example, we have a food web here that shows a few different animals in our uh, ecosystem. And the arrows are pointing to the animal that eats that other animal as prey. So this is a fairly simple food web and it shows the interdependence and connection between different animals in the ecosystem. Here is one that's a little bit more complicated. So this one might be a little bit more realistic. We have a bunch of different animals here. And if you were to take out the raccoon, for example, it would uh, change a lot of the arrows in this, in this uh, ecosystem here. And now I'm gonna show you even one that's more complex, and this is in a coastal environment. So this is an ecosystem that's even more delicate. So you don't have to read uh, what the names of the animals are. It's, it's very small, but you can see all of the different relationships that these animals have. This is a very delicate ecosystem, and uh, you can just tell how important each of these species is in the ecosystem. So another example of the relationship between predator and prey is represented in this graph here. So the top uh, line is the prey and the bottom line is the predator. As you can see, one population affects the other population. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So what are some other factors that affect populations? Uh, we like to put them in two different categories, overall categories. One of those would be biotic, and another one of those would be abiotic. So abiotic factors have to do with things like soil, air temperature, um, water, things in the water, things in the air. Biotic has to do with living things. Think, to, think of the word biology. So biotic has to do with uh, plants, animals, bacteria, humans, right? Uh, we have a very large effect on the environment. So we are a biotic factor because we're living, but we have an effect on the climate. So we have an effect on biotic factors, uh, abiotic factors. So humans are, bi are, are biotic, but we have an effect on abiotic factors. So these are things that affect um, the ecosystem and affect animals. So what are some of the biotic factors in our uh, environment here at Castle Rock. What are some of the predators that we have in this um, park? The first one that I want to discuss is the top predator, the apex predator, the predator that uh, doesn't have any other natural predators here, and that is the mountain lion. If you want a more in-depth um, overview of what's special about a mountain lion and why we have to protect it, check out the live stream from 1030 on the Castle Rock Facebook page. And I discussed more in depth about the mountain lion there. But the mountain lion is the top predator here. And it eats things like deer mostly. So it can eat up to 50 deer in a year. It can also eat smaller mammals like gophers, squirrels, mice, rabbits, birds, and uh, anything that it can catch. And it can catch a lot. So these animals, one interesting thing about them is that sometimes when they kill their prey, and like a big deer, they sort of cover it up and bury it for later because it's a lot of food. So they will uh, protect their, their catch and save it for another time. So that's one thing that they do with their prey. 
Another predator that we have who is a cousin to the mountain lion is the bobcat. The bobcat is a lot smaller than the mountain lion, but um, it's still considered, I think it's still considered a big cat. And so mountain, uh, bobcats, they usually don't hunt deer. Deer are sometimes a little bit too big for bobcats, but it has been documented that bobcats have hunted smaller deer and sometimes bigger deer, but they mostly eat smaller mammals like squirrels, gophers, uh, birds, things like that. So now let's take to the skies. You can imagine looking up in the sky at night time or around dusk. And uh, this animal has a bad reputation, unfortunately, but uh, this is the bat. And so the bat is a very crucial animal in this ecosystem. Um, and it's an animal that's misunderstood, I would say. So maybe for cultural reasons, um, like things having to do with Dracula, or um, current things like the coronavirus. Many people believe that the coronavirus uh, came or originated from a bat, although it hasn't been 100% confirmed. But bats are very important for many reasons. Uh, so one common myth is that they have a lot of diseases, but most bats don't carry that many diseases. Uh, so a very small percentage of bats do. But what bats are very important for is hunting at night. And what they hunt is insects. They have been studied to, to, have, to be able to kill up to 3,000 insects in a particular night, including mosquitoes. So these animals are really, really important in this ecosystem for controlling the population of insects. Um, moving on, let's stay in the skies, but uh, this is a different type of animal. We have our raptors, or our birds of prey. So in Castle Rock State Park, we have a few different um, predator birds. Some of those include the red, uh, red-tailed red hawk. We have a few different types of owls. We also have uh, a peregrine falcon. So the red-tailed hawk and the, the owls, they have similar diets. They eat small mammals mostly. Um, sometimes they eat snakes and other amphibians. But a peregrine falcon has a different diet. Uh, peregrine falcons mostly eat other birds. So peregrine falcons are the fastest animal in the world. They can reach speeds up to 242 miles per hour when they're diving. And they use this speed in order to catch other birds. So they eat mostly other birds. So let's go back down into the ground. Slithering around we have another predator that is found in Castle Rock State Park and that is the snake. Okay so specifically the rattlesnake is one of the snakes that is found in this park. Is one of the only venomous snakes um, in, uh, there's very few venomous snakes in North America and, it, and the rattlesnake is one of those. So the rattlesnake also has a bad reputation. Snakes in general have a bad reputation, but they're very important for maintaining balance in our ecosystem. Snakes usually eat um, smaller mammals like, again, squirrels, rabbits, um, gophers, things of that nature, and also other snakes and amphibians. So snakes are very important for keeping um, balance and keeping an ecosystem healthy. Um, so some prey are also predators and some predators are also prey. So it can go both ways. A lot of birds eat snakes like rattlesnakes. So uh, even though a rattlesnake is a predator, it is also a prey to some other animals. So let's talk about survival. These animals all want to survive and thrive. So they need different skills in order to survive, and those skills are what we call adaptations. Recently I learned, I started learning how to play guitar, so that is a skill that has taken me, I just started about a month ago, so it's taken me a little bit of time. But some of these adaptations and skills that these predators have, have taken many, many millions of years. So they're using their skills in order to survive and in order to keep the ecosystem balanced. So let's have a little thought experiment here. 
what would happen if a deer suddenly, all of a sudden, became really lazy, overweight, couldn't hear anymore? What would happen to the deer population? The deer population would decrease a lot, right? And the mountain lion population, and even bobcats probably would now be able to hunt them more, would go up. So that's one example of a small consequence of what would happen if uh, the species lost its skill. But it's not that simple, is it? Right? Deer have adapted to survive in this uh, ecosystem. But predators also have very important skills that they use in order to catch their prey. So some of these skills include speed, um, agility, uh, stealth, meaning they can hide easily, claws, and even teeth. So I'll show you some examples of these things. Here is a mountain lion skull. Okay. Unfortunately, it's not, well, fortunately, actually, it's not a real skull. But as you can see, they have very, very sharp teeth. And those are used for hunting and grabbing onto their prey. And I also have... I'll get it later. But here is a great horned owl. This is a great horned owl skull. And one of these uh, skills that it has is a very sharp beak. So the teeth and the beak of these animals helps them to catch other prey. Another example of uh, some adaptations that predators have are, for example, foxes. They can smell their prey two feet below the ground. So that's a very important skill that they have. Uh, bats. I mentioned bats earlier. Bats use echolocation in order to find their insects at night. So just with sound, they can hunt and that's an adaptation that they've gained over millions and millions of years. So we can generalize and say that um, one thing that is common among predators is that when they are hunting, uh, or let me rephrase, one thing that is common among predators is that their eyes face forward, and that is to help them focus, to help them hunt. So if we look at this skull again, it's a little bit hard to see, but the two eyes are facing forward. So this is the mountain lion skull. And that is an adaptation that's used so that they can focus, they can find their prey easily. Here's another picture that represents this idea. So as you can see, this mountain lion is running, it's chasing its prey, and its eyes are locked in with laser focus. So that's another generalization that we can make about predators, that their eyes face forward. But if we think about animals that we usually call prey, like rabbits or deer, um, different types of cattle, their eyes usually face outwards. So this is so that they can sort of see what's happening in their surrounding, right? So that they can see if something's coming to try to hunt them. And other things that predators, that prey have done in order to adapt are things that we call anti-predator adaptations. So anti-predator adaptations are ways that they can avoid detection or ways that they can get away easily. So if you have ever seen a hare, which is related to a rabbit, you might see that its ears are very, very long. They are twice as long as they are wide and they're able to move in many directions. So this is so that they can hear even the slightest change in their environment. If you've ever seen a deer in the distance, then maybe you tried to get out of your car and take a picture of it. And as you are coming close, you uh, accidentally step, step on a twig and the deer stops chewing, looks up at you, and its ears are probably turned in your direction. And if you try to get closer, the deer runs away. So the deer has incredible hearing. This is an anti-predator adaptation that it can use in order to uh, hear any danger that might be around. 
You've also probably seen a lizard without a tail. So this happens when a bird maybe is trying to hunt for a lizard, grabs onto its tail, and the lizard can release its tail at will. So this is an anti-predator adaptation that helps it escape. And they can actually grow them back too. Sometimes it takes about a year. But this is another adaptation that these animals have. So, in summary, we can say that predator and prey is extremely really, uh, important in order to keep the ecosystem well balanced. If one species, like the deer population, uh, goes up, then that causes a lot of problems. Too much vegetation is eaten, and that can be a problem for soil, for the environment, for other animals. So that's why we want to protect the population of prey. In the United States, there has been a long and complicated and controversial uh, history with large animals, uh, large predators, for example. Sometimes they're hunted out of fear. Sometimes they're hunted as trophies, um, like different bears or uh, or, pred or predators like cougars or big prey like raptors. Sometimes they're hunted and then put on walls. So there's been a complicated history that has happened over the years with these animals without the knowledge of their importance in the ecosystem. But that has started to change and recently, for example, the California Department of Fish and Game voted to keep the cougars or the mountain lions as an endangered animal on its uh, list for another 12 months. So that is another way that that we are starting to realize that these relationships are very important between predator and prey and they help um, maintain a healthy and diverse ecosystem. I don't see your question then you can comment later and I'll answer it later um, but yeah thank you for watching I'm here at Castle Rock State Park which again is currently closed, but uh, if you want more updates, go to parks.ca.gov slash flatten the curve in order to find more information. But I hope you enjoyed this talk about the importance of the relationship between predator and prey in creating balance here at Castle Rock State Park. All right, thank you.